section one of harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirtieth eighteen seventy nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirtieth eighteen seventy nine a coasting song from the quaint old farmhouse nestling warmly neath its overhanging thatch of snow out into the moonlight troop the children filling all the air with music as they go gliding sliding down the hill never minding cold nor chill o'er the silvered moonlit snow swift as arrow from the bow with a rush of mad delight through the crisp air of the night speeding far out o'er the plain trudging gaily up again to where the firelight's ruddy glow turns to gold the silver snow finer sport who can conceive than that of coasting new year's eve half the fun lies in the fire that seems to brighter blaze and higher than any other of the year as though his dying hour to cheer and at the same time greeting give to him who has a year to live tis built of logs of oak and pine filled in with branches broken fine it roars and crackles merrily the children round it dance with glee they sing and shout and welcome in the new year with a joyous din that rings far out o'er hill and dale and warns the watchers in the vale tis time the church bells to employ to spread the universal joy then the hill is left in silence as the coasters homeward go and the crimson of the firelight fades from off the trodden snow so the years glide by as swiftly as the sleds rush down the hill and each new one as it cometh bringeth more of good than ill the fairy's token ethelreda the fairy of northland was singing a song to herself as she swung from a wreath of soft snowflakes and smile to another bright elf what token shall we send to our darling our name child fair ethel below in the house which is down in the valley all covered and calm in the snow shall we gather our glorious jewels and wind them about her lithe form they would glitter and glance in the sunshine and merrily gleam in the storm shall we clothe her in whitest of ermine and robe her as grand as a queen weave her laces of ice and of frost work a mantle of glistening sheen she would shudder and cry at the clasping she would moan aloud in her woe and think the gay robes had been fashioned by cruelest bitterest foe i will none of these gifts for my darling neither jewels nor laces rare neither diamonds nor pearls of cold anguish my gift shall be tender and fair early ethel awoke christmas morning and found on her pillow that day a bunch of bright little snowdrops from kind ethel rita the fay end of section one section two of harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirty eighteen seventy nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tally Haas. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30, 1879. The Brave Swiss Boy, Part 8. The Reward of Fidelity, begun in Number 1 of Harper's Young People, November 4. Walter met with a friendly reception from General de Bogie a brave old warrior who had served under napoleon and fought at waterloo where he had been severely wounded and had lost his right foot by a cannonball his hair was gray and his countenance weather-beaten but in spite of his age and infirmities he enjoyed tolerably good health and was always in good humor having from long experience become a keen observer of those around him it was not long before he recognized the merits of his new servant to whom he soon became as much attached as his nephew had been. Walter had been about three months in the general's service, 
and it seemed to all appearance as if he was likely to become a permanency there when a letter arrived from paris the reading of which suddenly changed the customary gaiety of the old man into the deepest gloom this is a sad affair said he to walter who happened to be in the room at the time my poor nephew mr lamford what is the matter with him inquired walter earnestly he is ill dangerously ill poor fellow so the doctor informs me replied the general you can read the letter yourself he seems to complain of being surrounded by strangers with no one in the house that he can rely on if i were not such an old cripple i would go and help him to the best of my ability for although he has led a thoughtless reckless life a more thorough-hearted gentleman does not live poor adolf i must go to him sir said walter suddenly after hastily reading the letter the perusal of which had driven all colour from his cheeks you why it's not long since you left him and what do you want to go back for inquired the general in surprise can you not guess sir i must go and nurse him he must at least have one person near him to pay him some attention if you care for him so exclaimed the general why did you leave his service this led walter to explain to the old gentleman the reason which had compelled him to give up his situation and again to beg permission to act the part of nurse to his former master a tear sparkled in the old man's eyes as the youth declared the attachment he had always cherished for mr lamphond go to him then said he i cannot trust him to a more faithful attendant and as soon as i can i will follow you and take my place with you by his bedside poor adolf had he only possessed firmness of character and avoided bad company he might have been well and strong to-day but his unhappy weakness has brought him to the grave before his time in spite of all my warnings and entreaties as he has sowed so he must reap ah walter his fate is a terrible proof of the consequences of evil habits but all regrets are useless now let us lose no time in giving what little help we can making all the necessary preparations for the journey without a moment's delay walter soon reached paris when he entered the chamber of mr lafond he was shocked at the change which a few short months had made in his appearance it was evident that the doctor had rather disguised than exaggerated the danger he was in the sunken eyes and withered face showed only too plainly that the space of time allotted to him on earth was but short walter sank on his knees by the bedside and taking the pale and wasted hand in his breathed a prayer that god might see fit to deal mercifully with a life yet so young while the invalid smiled faintly and stroked the cheeks of the faithful attendant dear walter how good of you to come back murmured the invalid i thought you would not leave me alone to die i feared that your prediction would prove true and therefore i did not wish you to go home i wanted to have a friend with me at the last moment which i feel cannot be far off now the faithful switzer saw that mr lafond too well knew the critical condition he was in to be deceived by any false hopes and he therefore did everything in his power to make the last days of the dying man as free from pain and discomfort as possible who could tell what might be the effect even at so late a period of careful nursing and devoted attention but all this thoughtful and loving care seemed in vain the end is coming said the invalid one evening as the glowing rays of the evening sun streamed into his apartment i shall never more look upon yonder glorious sun or hear the gay singing of the birds i have something to say to you walter before i go do you see the black cabinet in the corner i bequeath it to you with everything it contains and hope with all my heart that it will help you on in the world as you deserve here is the key of my desk in which you will find my will which confirms you in possession of the cabinet and all its contents now give me your hand dear boy let me look once more upon your honest face may heaven bless you for all your kindness and devotion farewell walter bent over the face of the dying man 
and looked at him with deep emotion. He smiled and closed his eyes, but after laying in a quiet slumber for about an hour, he woke with a spasm. His head fell back, and the helpless victim died in the arms of his faithful servant. The long hours of the night were passed by Walter in weeping and prayer beside the corpse of the master to whose kindness he had owed so much. But when morning dawned, he roused himself from his grief and gave the directions that were necessary under the melancholy circumstances. It was a great relief to him that General de Bogie arrived toward evening to pay the last honors to his deceased nephew. Two days afterward the funeral took place, and as the mortal remains were deposited in the family grave, Walter's tears flowed afresh as he thought of the many proofs of friendship he had received from his departed master. A day or two afterward he was awakened from his sorrow by news from home. The letter was from neighbor Friar Chardet, who again thanked him for the money he had received for the sale of the cattle, praised him for the faithfulness and ability with which he had managed the business, and then went on to speak of Walter's father. The old man, he wrote, is in good health, but he feels lonely and longs for you to come back. If Wadi only were here, I should feel quite young again, he has said to me a hundred times. He sends you his love, and Sefi, who is still with me and is now a faithful servant, does the same. So goodbye, Walter. I think you now know what you had better do. Without any delay, Walter hastened to the general, showing him the letter, and told him he had decided to leave Paris and return home. The general used all his powers of persuasion, promises to regard the young mountaineer as his own son, but it was all of no use. Walter spoke so earnestly of his father's solitary home and the desire he felt to see his native mountains once more that the old gentleman had to reconcile himself to parting with him. Go home, then, he said. When the voice of duty calls, it is sinful to resist. But before you go, we must open my nephew's will. It will surprise me very much if there is nothing in it of importance to you. Unlocking the desk... The will was found sealed up as it had been left by Mr. Lafond. After opening it, the general read the document carefully through and laid it down on the table with an expression of disappointment. Poor fellow, he exclaimed. Death must have surprised him too suddenly, Walter, or he would certainly have left you a larger legacy. This is all he says about you. To Walter Herzl, my faithful and devoted servant, I bequeath the black cabinet in my bedroom with all its contents, and thank him sincerely for all his attention to me. That is the whole of it. But never mind, my young friend, the old general is still alive, and he will make good all that his nephew has forgotten. Walter shook his head. Thanks a thousand times, dear sir, but indeed I wish for nothing. My feet will carry me to my native valley, and once I am there, I can easily earn my living. I dare say there will be some little keepsake in the cabinet that I can take in memory of my poor master, and I want nothing more. Then search the cabinet at once. Where's the key? Here, said Walter, taking it from his pocket. Mr. Lafond gave me the cabinet shortly before his death and handed me the key at the same time. And have you never thought of opening it to see what it contained? No, replied Walter. It did not occur to me to do so, but I will go and see now. With these words, he left the room and went up to the apartment where the piece of furniture stood. In the various drawers were found the watch, ring, and jewelry his master had been accustomed to wear. As he viewed these tokens of regard, his eyes were bedewed with melancholy gratitude. Carefully placing the jewelry in a little box, he was about to close the cabinet again when his eye fell upon a drawer which he had omitted to open. Here, to his infinite surprise, he found a packet with the inscription in his late master's handwriting, The Reward of Fidelity, which, on opening, he found to contain banknotes for one hundred thousand francs. Well, what have you found? inquired the general eagerly, when the half-bewildered youth returned. This watch and jewelry and a packet of banknotes, replied Walter, laying them on the table. One hundred thousand francs! exclaimed the old gentleman. This is something worth having. Why, that will be a fortune to you, and I am now sorry that I did my nephew the injustice to think he had forgotten you. I wish you joy with all my heart. For what do you wish me joy, sir? For what? For the money, 
said the general in surprise. But that is not for me, said the Switzer, shaking his head. This watch and jewelry I will keep as long as I live in memory of my good master, but the money must have been left there by mistake, and I should feel like a thief if I were to take any of it. The old general opened his eyes as wide as he could, and stared in astonishment at the simplicity of the youth. "'I am afraid you are out of your mind,' said he. "'The will says, the black cabinet with all its contents. "'The banknotes were in it, and of course they are yours. "'And yet it must be a mistake.' "'But I tell you, it is no mistake,' exclaimed the general impatiently. "'Look at the inscription. "'The reward of fidelity. "'To whom should that apply but to you? "'Put the money in your pocket, Walter, "'and let us have no more absurd doubts about it.' "'But the young man persisted.' in his refusal, and pushed the packet away from him. "'It is too much,' said he. "'I cannot think of robbing you of such a large sum.' "'Well, then,' said the general, greatly touched by such singular unselfishness, "'I must settle the business. "'If you won't take the money, I will take you. "'From this day, Walter, you are my son. "'Come to my heart. "'Old as it is, it beats warmly for fidelity and honesty. "'Thanks to God,' that he has given me such a son in my old age. Walter stood as if rooted to the spot, but the old man drew him to his breast and embraced him warmly, till both found relief for their feelings in tears. "'But my father,' stammered the young man at last, "'my father is all alone at home.' "'Oh, we will start off to him at once, bag and baggage,' exclaimed the general. "'I know your fatherland well, and shall very soon feel myself more at home there,' Then I am in France, where there is not a creature left to care for me. Yes, Walter, we will go to the glorious Bernus Oberland, and buy ground and build a house, within view of your noble mountains, and live there with your father. He shall have cattle and goats to cheer his heart in his old age, and we will lead a happy life together as long as God spares us. Walter, in his happiness, could scarcely believe his ears, and thought the whole a splendid dream. But he soon found the reality. The general sold his property in France and departed with his adopted son to Switzerland, where he carried out the intention he had so suddenly formed. Old Tony Herzl renewed his youth when he had his son once more beside him, and he and the general soon became fast friends. A year had scarcely passed ere a beautiful house was built near Meringen and furnished with every comfort while an ample garden surrounded by meadows in which cows and oxen fed added to the beauty of the scene walter's dream had become a reality and everything around him was so much better than he had ever dared to hope that his heart overflowed with gratitude to god and to the benefactor who had done so much for him nor was his prosperity undeserved walter had not spent his time in idleness and sloth he knew that the diligent hand maketh its owner rich and he managed the land with so much energy and skill that he soon became renowned as one of the best farmers in the oberland the general and tony assisted him with their counsel and help as far as they were able and the old soldier soon experienced the beneficial influence of an active outdoor life and the change of air and scene his pale cheeks grew once more ruddy with health and he soon grew so active that he even forgot that his right foot lay buried in the fields of Waterloo. Thus the little family lived in happiness, enjoying the good wishes of all their neighbors and the gratitude of all who were in want, for they were always ready to relieve out of their abundance any who needed it. Mr. Seymour increased their happiness by visiting his friend Walter nearly every year and rejoiced in his prosperity which God had bestowed upon him as a reward for his honesty and uprightness. The End End of Section 2 Recording by Tally Haas Section 3 of Harper's Young People Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30, 1879 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30, 1879. 
around the world in a steam yacht the beautiful steam yacht henriette of which a picture is given on this page has just left new york bound on a pleasure voyage around the world her passengers are her owner monsieur henri say and his wife and child and they will doubtless have a most pleasant voyage and see many strange sights and countries before it is ended the general outline of the route to be pursued is from new york down the coast touching at baltimore and washington and possibly at some of the southern ports then to the west indies where several weeks will be spent in cruising among the beautiful islands some of the principal south american cities will be visited before stormy cape horn is doubled and the henriette enters the quieter waters of the pacific then the plan of the voyage includes the sandwich islands san francisco japan china australia the east indian islands india arabia the red sea egypt the suez canal turkey the many interesting countries bordering on the mediterranean and at last france where monsieur say's home is and where the long voyage will end in the harbor of nantes the henriette was built at newburgh on the hudson last summer at a cost of fifty thousand dollars and was originally named the chagron but she was sold and her name changed before she went on her first cruise she is rigged as a topsail schooner and under steam can make seventeen knots an hour which is very fast travelling she is two hundred five feet long overall and is the largest steam yacht but one ever built in this country she is to be accompanied in her trip around the world by a smaller steam yacht or tender named the follet in which will be carried quantities of choice provisions and extra supplies of all kinds the crew of the henriette numbers thirty men all of whom are french excepting her engineers who are americans and the discipline maintained on board is that of a french man-o-war the new year's errand what are those children doing asked the clergyman of his wife a few days after christmas i really cannot tell you james was the reply as his wife peered anxiously over his shoulder and out of the window all that i know about it is this i was busy in the pantry when rob put his head in and asked if he could have the christmas tree as nearly everything had been taken off of it so i said yes and there he goes with it sure enough i do hope the wax from the candles has not spotted the parlor carpet don't be anxious wife christmas comes but once a year and when it comes should bring good cheer yes said the careful housewife i suppose i do worry but there it is snowing again and bertha perched up on that tree on rob's sled and she's so subject to croup the more she is out in the pure air the less likely she is to take hold but where are they going i really do not know james did you ever see a dog more devoted to any one than jip is to rob there he goes dancing beside him now and i see rob is tied on the scarf bertha knit for him that is done to please her she did work so hard to get it finished in time before he came home for the holidays she is very like her own dear little mother in kindness and care for others was the reply the mother gave a bright smile and a kiss for the compliment but a little wail from the nursery hurried her out of the room christmas at the parsonage had been delightful for first of all rob's return from boarding school was a pleasurable event he always came home in such good spirits was so full of his jokes and nonsense and had so many funny things to tell about the boys then there was the dressing of the church with evergreens and the decoration of the parlor with wreaths of holly or running pine and the spicy smell of all the delicacies which were in course of preparation for sally was a famous cook and would brook no interference when mince pies and plum pudding were to be concocted but the children thought the arrival of a certain box which was always dispatched from town the very best of all the christmas delights this box came from their rich aunts and uncles who seemed to think that the little parsonage must be a dreary place in winter and so to make up to its inmates for losing all the brightness of a city winter they sent everything they could think of in the way of beautiful pictures gorgeous books games sugar plums and enough little glittering things for two or three trees 
of course the clergyman always laid aside some of these things for other occasions lest the children be surfeited and so christmas had passed happily as usual the school children had sung their carols and enjoyed their feast the poor had been carefully looked after and made comfortable and there had come the usual lull after a season of excitement it was now the day before the first of the new year and the parson was writing a sermon he was telling people what a good time it was to try and turn over a new leaf to be nobler truer braver than they had ever been before to let the old year carry away with it all selfishness all anger envy and unloving thoughts and as he wrote he looked out of the window at the falling snow and wondered where bob and bertha could have gone dinner time came aunt ellen mamma and the parson sat down alone where are those children repeated mamma i do not think you need to be worried kate said aunt ellen rob is so thoughtful he will take good care of bertha they have perhaps stopped in at a neighbor's and been coaxed to stay very likely said the parson and then the baby came in crowing and chuckling and claiming his privileges such as sitting in a high chair and feeding the cat and mamma had enough to do to keep the merry fellow in order or his fat little hands would have grasped all the silver and pulled over the glasses after dinner while the parson let the baby twist his whiskers or creep about his knees mamma played some lovely german music and aunt ellen crocheted the short afternoon grew dusky baby went off to the nursery the parson had lighted his cigar and was going out for a walk but mamma looked so anxious that he said i will go look for the children kate really i think you will have to give rob a little scolding my dear he should have told us where he was going yes i suppose so said the parson when just then there was a gleeful cry a merry chorus made up of rob's bertha's and jip's voices and there they were bertha on the sled and rob was her horse where have you been my son said the parson trying to be severe you should not have gone off in this manner for the whole day without asking permission rob's bright smile faded a little but bertha said quickly please papa don't scold rob if you only knew hush bertha said rob and red as his cheeks were they grew redder i am sorry you are offended sir i did not mean to be so long we were detained what detained you and where did you get your dinner asked mamma oh we had plenty to eat but you don't intend us to know where you got it no sir said rob frankly now papa you shall not scold rob said bertha putting her hand in his come into your study go away rob go give jip his supper come mamma and bertha dragged them both into the fire where with sparkling eyes and cheeks like carnation she began to talk mamma you remember that scrimmage rob got into with the village boys last fourth of july and how hatefully they knocked him down and how bruised his eye was for a long time yes i remember and i always blamed rob he should never have had anything to do with those rowdies i didn't blame him i never blame rob for anything except when he won't do what i want him to do well the worst one of all those horrid boys is sim jenkins at least he was i don't think he's quite so bad now but he has been punished for all his badness for he hurt his leg awfully and has been laid up for months so his mother says and she is quite nice she gave us our dinner to-day somehow or other rob heard that sim was in bed and had not had any christmas things and that his mother was poor and she says all her money has gone for doctor's bills and medicine and so it just came into his head that perhaps it would do sim good to have a christmas tree on new year's day and he asked mrs jenkins and she was afraid it would make a muss but rob said he would be careful and so he carried our tree over and fixed it in a box and covered the box with moss and we have been as busy as bees trying to make it look pretty and that is what has kept us so long for rob had to run down to the store and get things nails and ribbons and i don't know what all and sim is not to know anything about the tree until to-morrow and please give us some of the pretty things which were in our box for we could not get quite enough to fill all the branches rob spent so much of his pocket money on a knife for sim that he had none left for candy for he said the tree would not give sim so much pleasure unless there was something on it 
which he could always keep here little bertha stopped for want of breath and looked into the faces of her listeners the parson put his arm around her as he said i hardly think we can scold rob now after special pleading so eloquent as this what do you say mamma i say that rob is just like his father in doing this kindly deed and i am glad to be the mother of a boy who can return good for evil the parson made a bow now we are even madam in the matter of gracious speeches so sim jenkins woke up on new year's day to see from his weary bed a vision of brightness a little tree laden with its fruit of kindness its flowers of a forgiving spirit and as the parson preached his new year's sermon and saw rob's dark eyes looking up at him he thought of the verse in their young hearts soft and tender guide my hand good seed to sow that its blossoming may praise thee wheresoever they go end of section three section four of harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirtieth eighteen seventy nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirtieth eighteen seventy nine lafayette's first wound the marquis of lafayette came to this country to give his aid in the struggle for liberty in seventeen seventy seven and his first battle was that of the brandywine washington was trying to stop the march of the british toward philadelphia there was some mistake in regard to the roads and the american troops were badly beaten lafayette plunged into the heart of the fight and just as the americans gave way he received a musket ball in the thigh this was the eleventh of september writing to his wife the next day he said our americans held their ground firmly for quite a time but were finally put to rout in trying to rally them messieurs the english paid me the compliment of a gunshot which wounded me slightly in the leg but that's nothing my dear heart the bullet touched neither bone nor nerve and it will cost nothing more than lying on my back some time which puts me in bad humor but the wound of which the marquis wrote so lightly in order to reassure his beloved wife kept him confined for more than six weeks he was carried on a boat up to bristol and when the fugitive congress left there he was taken to the moravian settlement at bethlehem where he was kindly cared for on the first of october he wrote again to his wife as general howe when he gives his royal master a high-flown account of his american exploits must report me wounded he may report me killed it would cost nothing but i hope you won't put any faith in such reports as to the wound the surgeons are astonished at the promptness of its healing they fall into ecstasies whenever they dress it and protest that it's the most beautiful thing in the world as for me i find it a very disgusting thing wearisome and quite painful that depends on tastes but after all if a man wanted to wound himself for fun he ought to come and see how much i enjoy it he was very grateful for the attention he received all the doctors in america he writes are in motion for me i have a friend who has spoken in such a way that i am well nursed general washington this worthy man whose talents and virtues i admire whom i venerate more the more i know him has kindly become my intimate friend i am established in his family we live like two brothers closely united in reciprocal intimacy and confidence when he sent me his chief surgeon he told him to care for me as if i were his son for he loved me as such this friendship between the great commander in the prime of life and the french boy of twenty is one of the most touching incidents of our history the rock of gibraltar this great natural fortification which among military men is regarded as the key to the mediterranean sea abounds in caverns many of which are natural while others have been made by the explosion of gunpowder in the centre of the mountain forming great vaults of such height and extent that in case of a siege they would contain the whole garrison the caverns the most considerable is the hall of st george 
communicate with the batteries established all along the mountain by a winding road passable throughout on horseback the extreme singularity of the place has given rise to many superstitious stories not only amongst the ancients but even those of our own times as it has been penetrated by the hardy and enterprising to a great distance on one occasion by an american who descended by ropes to a depth of five hundred feet a wild story is current that the cave communicates by a submarine passage with africa the sailors who had visited the rock and seen the monkeys which are seen in no other part of europe and are only there occasionally and at intervals say that they pass at pleasure by means of the cave to their native land the truth seems to be that they usually live in the inaccessible precipices of the eastern side of the rock where there is a scanty store of monkey grass for their subsistence but when an east wind sets in it drives them from their caves and they take refuge among the western rocks where they may be seen hopping from bush to bush boxing each other's ears and cutting the most extraordinary antics if disturbed they scamper off with great rapidity the young ones jumping on the backs and putting their arms round the necks of the old and as they are very harmless strict orders have been received from the garrison for their special protection gibraltar derives its chief importance from its bay which is about ten miles in length and eight in breadth and being protected from the more dangerous winds is a valuable naval station end of section four Section 5 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30, 1879. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30, 1879. Santa Claus Visits the Van Johnsons. Swing low sweet chariot gone for to car me home swing low sweet chariot gone for to car me home devil taught he would spite me gone for to car me home my cutting down my apple tree gone for to car me home but it didn't spite i me at all gone for to carry me home for i had apples all to fall gone oh jess shut up with yo apples christopher columbus van johnson and listen at that are what miss bowles done been a tellin me said queen victoria suddenly making her appearance at the gate which opened out of mrs bowles back garden into the small yard where her brother sat with primrose ann in his arms the van johnsons were a colored family who lived in a southern city in a small three-roomed wooden house on the lot in the rear of mrs bowles garden and mrs bowles was their landlady and a very good friend indeed i don't know what they would have done without her for when she came from the north and rented the big house they were in the depths of poverty the kind lady found them work gave them bright smiles words of encouragement fruit vegetables and spelling lessons and so won their simple grateful hearts that they looked upon her as a miracle of patience goodness and wisdom and as for baby bowles the rosy-cheeked sweet-voiced sunshiny little thing the whole family from primrose ann up to mr van johnson adored her and queen victoria was happy as a queen when allowed to take care of and amuse her what's dat are yo speakin asked christopher columbus so named his father said cause he war de fustest child de discoverer of de family as it war as queen victoria hopped into the yard on one leg and he stopped rocking if you can call throwing yourself back on the hind legs of a common wooden chair and then coming down on the forelegs with a bounce and a bang rocking the youngest van johnson with such a jerk that her eyes and mouth flew open and out of the latter came a tremendous yell dar now said christopher columbus yo's done gone and woke up dis yer primrose ann and i's been hours and hours and hours and hours gettin her sleep 
girls am de worstest bodders i ever see i allus dis hated girls ain't yo shamed yo'self christopher columbus said queen victoria indignantly when both yo sisters am girls but spect yo don't want to listen at what miss bowles done been a tellin me hi washington webster's a comin and i'll just tell him dat our secret all by hisself no you won't you goin to tell me too said her big brother and yo better stop to rollin your eyes you got the sassiest eyes i ever see since the day that i were born and go on with your story story repeated washington webster sauntering up to them leading a big cat dragging perhaps would be the better word as poor puss was trying hard to get away by a string about master santa claus said queen opening her eyes so wide that they seemed to spread over half her face miss bowles says tomorrow's christmas and today's day before christmas and tonight master santa claus go bout lowering her voice almost to a whisper and puts things in chillin stockings dat have deir selves and master santa claus any lashin to dat or old man wif de allspice hoof asked washington webster with a scared look allspice hoof listen at that dar foolish young crow clove hoof yo means said queen victoria dat's another gem entirely master santa claus am good he gets yo dolls and candies and apples and nuts and books and drums and whistles and new clothes golly wish he'd throw some trousers and jackets and sich like fruit round here said christopher columbus trousers with red spenders and pistol pocket said washington webster and a gold watch and a sled all yellow with green stars on it and you both talk as if you been awful good interrupted queen victoria maybe massa zanny claus disagree with yo who dat are done gone get her head crack with de wooden spoon for gobbling all de hominy before de breakfast were ready said washington webster slyly i most wish dar were no washington websters in de whole world i certainly do day's too sassy to lib said queen victoria in sich busybodies dey certainly is but how am we to know whether we's massa zanny claus is kind of good chillin said christopher columbus we might be good enough for ourselves and not good enough for him if i knowed he come here sutton sure i get some green ornamentses from old pete campbell he done gone got hundreds and hundreds and piles and piles to stick up on the walls and make the house look more despectable like let's go and ax miss bowles said queen victoria baby bowles am fast asleep and she's in the kitchen making pies and she know everything she certainly do and off they trooped primrose ann cat and all come in called the pleasant voice of their landlady when they rapped on her door and in they tumbled asking the same question all together in one breath massa zanny claus coming to our house miss bowles christopher columbus adding pears dough we must ornament em some if he do mrs bowles crimped the edge of her last pie and then sat down the children standing in a row before her have you all been very good she said suppose you tell me what good thing you've done since yesterday afternoon then i can guess about santa claus primrose ann cried for dat ar orange yo give me said queen victoria after a moment's thought and i et it up quick as i could and didn't give her none cause i's fraid she'd get the stomach ache i carried home de washin for mommy for two cakes and some candy said washington webster and you asked mrs bowles turning to christopher columbus i ran way from dolphus snow and wouldn't fight em cause i fraid i hurt em said christopher columbus gravely mrs bowles laughed merrily go home and ornament she said i'm sure santa claus will pay you a visit and he did for on christmas morning when the young van johnsons rushed pell-mell helter-skelter into the room prepared for his call a new jacket hung on one chair a new pair of trousers on the other a doll's head peeped out of queen victoria's stocking a new sled gaily painted announced itself in big letters the go-ahead lots of toys were waiting for primrose ann and four papers of goodies reposed on the lowest shelf of the cupboard 
"'Pears that our Master Santa Claus don't take exact measure for boys' clothes,' said Christopher Columbus as he tried to struggle into the jacket. "'This year jacket's twice it too small.' And this year trouser loons am twice it too big, said Washington Webster as he drew them up to his armpits. Lord bless you, honey bugs, called their mommy from the doorway. Yo has got tangs mixed. Dat our jackets for de other boy, and dem trousers too. And they all burst out laughing as Christopher Columbus and Washington Webster exchanged Christmas gifts, and laughed so loud that Mrs. Bowles came over to see what was the matter bringing baby bowls who seeing how jolly everybody was began clapping her tiny hands and shouting melly kiss me melly kiss me end of section five section six of harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirtieth eighteen seventy nine this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30, 1879. Pet and Her Cat Now, Pussy, I've something to tell you. You know it is New Year's Day. The big folks are down in the parlor, and Mama is just gone away. We are all alone in the nursery, and I want to talk to you, dear, so you must come and sit by me and make believe you hear. You see, there's a new year coming. It only begins today. Do you know I was often naughty in the year that is gone away? You know I have some bad habits. I'll mention just one or two, but there really is quite a number of naughty things that I do. You see, I don't learn my lessons and oh i do hate them so i doubt if i know any more today than i did a year ago perhaps i am awfully stupid they say i'm a dreadful dunce how would you like to learn spelling i wish you could try it once and don't you remember christmas twas naughty i must confess but while i was eating my dinner i got two spots on my dress and they caught me stealing the sugar but i only got two little bits when they found me there in the closet and frightened me out of my wits and pussy when people scold me i'm always so sulky then if they only would tell me gently i never would do it again oh pussy i know i am naughty and often it makes me cry i think it would count for something if they knew how hard i try but i'll try again in the new year and oh i shall be so glad if i only can be a good little girl and never do anything bad. How Sunken Ships Are Raised When a ship sinks some distance from the shore in several fathoms of water, and the waves conceal her, it may seem impossible to some of our readers that she can ever be floated again. But if she rests upon a firm sandy bottom, without rocks, and the weather is fair enough for a time to give the wreckers an opportunity, it is even probable that she can be brought into port in boston new york philadelphia baltimore norfolk and new orleans large firms are established whose special business it is to send assistance to distressed vessels and to save the cargo if the vessels themselves cannot be prevented from becoming total wrecks and these firms are known as wreckers a name which in the olden time was given to a class of heartless men dwelling on the coast who lured ships ashore by false lights for the sake of the spoils which the disaster brought them when a vessel is announced to be ashore or sunk the owners usually apply to the wreckers and make a bargain with them that they shall receive a certain proportion of her value if they save her and the wreckers then proceed to the scene of the accident taking with them powerful tugboats large pontoons immense iron cables and a massive derrick perhaps only the topmasts of the wreck are visible when they reach it but even though she is quite out of sight she is not given up if the sea is calm and the wind favorable one of the men puts a diving dress over his suit of heavy flannels the trousers and jacket are made of india rubber cloth fitting close to the ankles wrists and across the chest 
which is further protected by a breastplate a copper helmet with a glass face is used for covering the head and is screwed on to the breastplate one end of a coil of strong rubber tubing is attached to the back of the helmet to the outside of which a running cord is also attached and continued down the side of the dress to the diver's right hand where he can use it for signalling his assistance when he is beneath the surface his boots have leaden soles weighing about twenty eight pounds and as this with the helmet is insufficient to allow his descent four blocks of lead weighing fifty pounds are slung over his shoulders and a waterproof bag containing a hammer a chisel and a dirk knife is fastened over his breast he is transferred from the steamer that has brought him from the city to a small boat which is rowed to a spot over the wreck and a short iron ladder is put over the side down which he steps and when the last rung is reached he lets go and the water bubbles and sparkles over his head as he sinks deeper and deeper the immersion of the diver is more thrilling to a spectator than it is to him the rubber coil attached to his helmet at one end is attached at the other to an air pump which sends him all the breath he needs and if the supply is irregular a pull at the cord by his right hand secures its adjustment he is not timid and he knows that the only thing he has to guard against is nervousness by which he might lose his presence of mind the fish dart away from him at a motion of his hand and even a shark is terrified by the apparition of his strange globular helmet he is careful not to approach the wreck too suddenly as the tangled rigging and splinters might twist or break the air pipe and signal line when his feet touch the bottom he looks behind before and above him before he advances an inch looming up before him like a phantom in the foggy light is the ship and now perhaps if any of the crew have gone down with her the diver feels a momentary horror but if no one has been lost he sets about his work and hums a cheerful tune it may be that the vessel has settled low in the sand that she is broken in two or that the hole in her bottom cannot be repaired but we will suppose that the circumstances are favourable that the sand is firm and that the hull in an easy position the diver signals to be hauled up makes his report and in his next descent he is accompanied by several others who help him to drag massive chains of iron underneath the ship at the bow at the stern and in the middle this is a tedious and exhausting operation which sometimes takes many days and when it is completed the pontoons are towed into position at each side of the ship the pontoons simply described are hollow floats they are oblong built of wood and possess great buoyancy some of them are over a hundred feet long eighteen feet wide and fourteen feet deep but their size and the number of them used depend on the length of the vessel that is to be raised circular tubes or wells extend through them and when the chains are secured underneath the ship the ends are inserted in these wells by the divers and drawn up through them by hydraulic power the chains thus form a series of loops like the common swing of the playground in which the ship rests and as they are shortened in being drawn up through the wells the ship lifts the ship lifts if all be well if the chains do not part or some other accident occur but the wreckers need great patience and sometimes they see the labor of weeks undone in a minute we are presupposing success however and instead of sinking or capsizing the ship appears above the bubbling water and between the pontoons which groan and tremble with her weight as soon as her decks are above water so much of the cargo is removed as is necessary to enable the divers to reach the broken part of the hull which they patch with boards and canvas if she is built of wood or with iron plates if she is of iron this is the most perilous part of the divers work as there are so many projections upon which his air tube may catch but he finds it almost as easy to ply his hammer and drill in making repairs under water as on shore the ship is next pumped out and borne between the pontoons by powerful tugs to the nearest dry dock where all the damages are finally repaired and in a month or two she is once more afloat with nothing to indicate her narrow escape
End of section six. Section seven of Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Nine, December thirtieth, eighteen seventy nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30, 1879. Section 7. The History of Photogen and Nicaris, A Day and Night Märchen, by George MacDonald. Begun in Number 5 of Harper's Young People, December 2nd chapter sixteen an evil nurse watha was herself ill as i have said and was the worst tempered and besides it is a peculiarity of witches that what works in others to sympathy works in them to repulsion also watha had a poor helpless rudimentary spleen of a conscience left just enough to make her uncomfortable and therefore more wicked so when she heard that photogen was ill she was angry ill indeed after all she had done to saturate him with the life of the system with the solar might itself he was a wretched failure the boy and because he was her failure she was annoyed with him began to dislike him grew to hate him she looked on him as a painter might upon a picture or a poet upon a poem which he had only succeeded in getting into an irrevocable mess in the hearts of witches love and hate lie close together and often tumble over each other and whether it was that her failure with photogen foiled also her plans in regard to nycteris or that her illness made her yet more of a devil's wife certainly watho now got sick of the girl too and hated to have her about the castle she was not too ill however to go to poor photogen's room and torment him she told him she hated him like a serpent and hissed like one as she said it looking very sharp in the nose and chin and flat in the forehead photogen thought she meant to kill him and hardly ventured to take anything brought him she ordered every ray of light to be shut out of his room but by means of this he got a little used to the darkness she would take one of his arrows and now tickle him with the feather end of it now prick him with the point till the blood ran down what she meant finally i cannot tell but she brought photogen speedily to the determination of making his escape from the castle what he should do then he would think afterward who could tell but he might find his mother somewhere beyond the forest if it were not for the broad patches of darkness that divided day from day he would fear nothing but now as he lay helpless in the dark ever and anon would come dawning through it the face of the lovely creature who on that first awful night nursed him so sweetly was he never to see her again if she was as he had concluded the nymph of the river why had she not reappeared she might have taught him not to fear the night for plainly she had no fear of it herself but then when the day came she did seem frightened why was that seeing there was nothing to be afraid of then perhaps one so much at home in the darkness was correspondingly afraid of the light then his selfish joy at the rising of the sun blinding him to her condition had made him behave to her in ill return for her kindness as cruelly as watho behaved to him how sweet and dear and lovely she was if there were wild beasts that came out only at night and were afraid of the light why should there not be girls too made the same way who could not endure the light as he could not bear the darkness if only he could find her again ah how differently he would behave to her but alas perhaps the sun had killed her melted her burned her up dried her up that was it if she was the nymph of the river chapter seventeen watho's wolf 
From that dreadful morning Nycteris had never got to be herself again. The sudden light had been almost death to her, and now she lay in the dark with the memory of a terrific sharpness, a something she dared scarcely recall, lest the very thought of it should sting her beyond endurance. But this was as nothing to the pain which the recollection of the rudeness of the shining creature whom she had nursed through his fear caused her. For the moment his suffering passed over to her, and he was free, the first use he made of his returning strength had been to scorn her. She wondered and wondered. It was all beyond her comprehension. Before long, Watha was plotting evil against her. The witch was like a sick child weary of his toy. She would pull her to pieces and see how she liked it. She would set her in the sun and see her die, like a jellyfish from the salt ocean cast out on a hot rock. It would be a sight to soothe her wolf pain. One day, therefore, a little before noon, while Nycteris was in her deepest sleep, she had a darkened litter brought to the door, and in that she made two of her men carry her to the plain above. There they took her out, laid her on the grass, and left her. Watha watched it all from the top of her high tower, through her telescope, and scarcely was Nycteris left when she saw her sit up, and the same moment cast herself down again with her face to the ground. "'She'll have a sunstroke,' said Watho, "'and that'll be the end of her.' Presently, tormented by a fly, a huge humped buffalo with great shaggy mane came galloping along, straight for where she lay. At sight of the thing on the grass, he started, swerved yards aside, stopped dead, and then came slowly up, looking malicious. Nycteris lay quite still, and never even saw the animal. "'Now she'll be trodden to death,' said Watho. When the buffalo reached her, he sniffed at her all over, and went away. Then came back and sniffed again, then all at once went off as if a demon had him by the tail. Next came a new, then a gaunt wild boar, but no creature hurt her, and Watho was angry with the whole creation. At length, in the shade of her hair, the blue eyes of Nycteris began to come to themselves a little, and the first thing they saw was a comfort. I have told already how she knew the night daisies, each a sharp-pointed little cone with a red tip, and once she had parted the rays of one of them with trembling fingers, for she was afraid she was dreadfully rude, and perhaps was hurting it. But she did want, she said to herself, to see what secret it carried so carefully hidden, and she found its golden heart. But now, right under her eyes, inside the veil of her hair, in the sweet twilight of whose blackness she could see it perfectly, stood a daisy with its red tip opened wide into a carmine ring, displaying its heart of gold on a platter of silver. She did not at first recognize it as one of those cones come awake but a moment's notice revealed what it was. Who, then, could have been so cruel to the lovely little creature as to force it open like that, and spread it heart bare to the terrible death-lamp? Whoever it was, it must be the same that had thrown her out there to be burned to death in its fire. But she had her hair, and could hang her head, and make a small sweet night of her own about her. She tried to bend the daisy down and away from the sun, and to make its petals hang about it like her hair, but she could not. Alas, it was burned and dead already. She did not know that it could not yield to her gentle force because it was drinking life, with all the eagerness of life, from what she called the death lamp. Oh, how the lamp burned her! But she went on thinking. She did not know how and by and by began to reflect that, as there was no roof to the room except that in which the great fire went rolling about, the little red tip must have seen the lamp a thousand times, and must know it quite well, and it had not killed it. 
nay thinking about it farther she began to ask the question whether this in which she now saw it might not be its more perfect condition for now not only did the whole seem perfect as indeed it did before but every part showed its own individual perfection as well which perfection made it capable of combining with the rest into a higher perfection of a whole the flower was a lamp itself the golden heart was the light and the silver border was the alabaster globe skilfully broken and spread wide to let out the glory yes the radiant shape was plainly its perfection if then it was the lamp which had opened it into that shape the lamp could not be unfriendly to it but must be of its own kind seeing it made it perfect and again when she thought of it there was clearly no little resemblance between them what if the flower then was the little great-grandchild of the lamp and he was loving it all the time and what if the lamp did not mean to hurt her only could not help it the red tips looked as if the flower had some time or other been hurt what if the lamp was making the best it could of her opening her out somehow like the flower she would bear it patiently and see but how coarse the colour of the grass was perhaps however her eyes not being made for the bright lamp she did not see them as they were then she remembered how different were the eyes of the creature that was not a girl and was afraid of the darkness ah if the darkness would only come again all arms friendly and soft everywhere about her she lay so still that watho thought she had fainted she was pretty sure she would be dead before the night came to revive her End of section 7Section 8 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30th, 1879. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30th, 1879, Section 8. The History of Photogen and Nycteris, A Day and Night Merican, by george macdonald begun in number five of harper's young people december second chapter eighteen refuge fixing her telescope on the motionless form that she might see it at once when the morning came watha went down from the tower to photogen's room he was much better by this time and before she left him he had resolved to leave the castle that very night the darkness was terrible indeed but watha was worse than even the darkness and he could not escape in the day as soon therefore as the house seemed still he tightened his belt hung to it his hunting-knife put a flask of wine and some bread in his pocket and took his bow and arrows he got from the house and made his way at once up to the plain but what with his illness the terrors of the night and his dread of the wild beast when he got to the level he could not walk a step farther and sat down thinking it better to die than to live in spite of his fears however sleep contrived to overcome him and he fell at full length on the soft grass he had not slept long when he woke with such a strange sense of comfort and security that he thought the dawn at least must have arrived but it was dark night about him and the sky no it was not the sky but the blue eyes of his naiad looking down upon him once more he lay with his head in her lap and all was well for plainly the girl feared the darkness as little as he the day thank you he said you are like live armour to my heart you keep the fear off me i have been very ill since then did you come out of the river when you saw me cross i don't live in the water she answered i live under the pale lamp and i die under the bright one 
ah yes i understand now he returned i would not have behaved as i did last time if i had understood but i thought you were mocking me and i am so made that i cannot help being frightened at the darkness i beg your pardon for leaving you as i did for as i say i did not understand now i believe you were really frightened were you not i was indeed answered nycteris and shall be again but why you should be i cannot in the least understand you must know how gentle and sweet the darkness is how kind and friendly how soft and velvety it holds you to its bosom and loves you a little while ago i lay faint and dying under your hot lamp what is it you call it the sun murmured photogen how i wish he would make haste ah do not wish that do not for my sake hurry him i can take care of you from the darkness but i have no one to take care of me from the light as i was telling you i lay dying in the sun all at once i drew a deep breath a cool wind came and ran over my face i looked up the torture was gone for the death lamp itself was gone i hope he does not die and grow brighter yet my terrible headache was all gone and my sight was come back i felt as if i were new made but i did not get up at once for i was tired still the grass grew cool about me and turned soft in colour something wet came upon it and it was now so pleasant to my feet that i rose and ran about and when i had been running about a long time all at once i found you lying just as i had been lying a little while before so i sat down beside you to take care of you till your life and my death should come again how good you are you beautiful creature why you forgave me before ever i asked you cried photogen thus they fell a-talking and he told her what he knew of his history and she told him what she knew of hers and they agreed they must get away from watho as far as ever they could and we must set out at once said nycteris the moment morning comes returned photogen we must not wait for the morning said nycteris for then i shall not be able to move and what would you do the next night besides watho sees best in the daytime indeed you must come now photogen you must i cannot i dare not said photogen i cannot move if i but lift my head from your lap the very sickness of terror seizes me i shall be with you said nycteris soothingly i will take care of you till your dreadful son comes and then you may leave me and go away as fast as you can only please put me in a dark place first if there is one to be found i will never leave you again nycteris cried photogen only wait till the sun comes and brings me back my strength and we will go away together and never never part any more no no persisted nycteris we must go now and you must learn to be strong in the dark as well as in the day else you will always be only half brave i have begun already not to fight your son but to try to get at peace with him and understand what he really is and what he means with me whether to hurt me or to make the best of me you must do the same with my darkness but you don't know what mad animals there are away there toward the south said photogen they have huge green eyes and they would eat you up like a bit of celery you beautiful creature come come you must said nycteris or i shall have to pretend to leave you to make you come i have seen the green eyes you speak of and i will take care of you from them you how can you do that if it were day now i could take care of you from the worst of them but as it is i can't even see them for this abominable darkness i could not see your lovely eyes but for the light that is in them that lets me see straight into heaven through them they are windows into the very heaven beyond the sky 
I believe they are the very place where the stars are made. To be continued. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30th, 1879, Section 8, Continued, New Year's Gifts. The custom of giving and receiving gifts at the New Year dates from very early times indeed. The Druids used to cut down branches of their sacred mistletoe with a golden knife, and distribute them amongst the people as New Year's gifts. As they cut it down, they used to sing, Gather the mistletoe the new year is at hand end of section 8section 9 of harper's young people volume 1 issue 9 december 30th 1879 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 9, December 30, 1879. Advertisements To Publishers of Illustrated Magazines, etc. Electrotypes of Wooden Engravings of Every Description. New Illustrations Received Weekly. Advertising Space Taken in Part Payment. Brown and Pulverman, 1238 Broadway, New York harper's young people harper's young people will be issued every tuesday and may be had at the following rates payable in advance postage free single copies four cents one subscription one year one dollar fifty cents five subscriptions one year seven dollars subscriptions may begin with any number when no time is specified it will be understood that the subscriber desires to commence with the number issued after the receipt of order remittances should be made by post office money order or draft to avoid risk of loss advertising the extent and character of the circulation of harper's young people will render it a first-class medium for advertising a limited number of approved advertisements will be inserted in two inside pages at seventy-five cents per line address harper and brothers franklin square new york a liberal offer for eighteen eighty only harper's young people and harper's weekly will be sent to any address for one year commencing with the first number of harper's weekly for january eighteen eighty on receipt of five dollars for the two periodicals e i horsman manufacturer of fine archery send for illustrated catalogue eighty and eighty two william street new york i have given horsman's bows the hardest and most merciless test imaginable they stand better than any english bows of the same class and have all the good points desirable his snake wood backed and beef wood backed are better than the same of english make very sincerely yours maurice thompson skates and novelties send for catalogue r simpson one thirty two nassau street new york plays for young people with songs and choruses adapted for private theatricals with the music and necessary directions for getting them up sent on receipt of thirty cents by happy hours company number no. five beekman street new york send your address for a catalogue of tableau charades pantomimes plays reciters masks colored fire etc etc books for boys and girls the boy travelers in the far east adventures of two youths in a journey to japan and china by thomas w knox illustrated octavo cloth three dollars an involuntary voyage a book for boys by lucien biart illustrated duodecimo cloth one dollar twenty five cents adventures of a young naturalist by lucien biart edited by parker gilmore one hundred seventeen illustrations duodecimo cloth a dollar seventy five what mr darwin saw in his voyage round the world in the ship beagle adapted for youthful readers maps and illustrations octavo ornamental cloth three dollars the princess idleways by mrs w j hayes illustrated sexto decimo cloth seventy five cents stories of the old dominion by john Eston cook 
profusely illustrated duodecimo illuminated cloth one dollar fifty cents how to get strong and how to stay so by william blakey illustrated sexto decimo cloth one dollar the boys of seventy six a history of the battles of the revolution by charles carlton coffin copiously illustrated octavo cloth three dollars the story of liberty by charles carlton coffin copiously illustrated octavo cloth three dollars our children's songs illustrated octavo ornamental cover one dollar books for girls written or edited by the author of john halifax gentleman illustrated six volumes sexto decimo cloth in neat case five dollars forty cents the volume separately ninety cents each little sunshine's holiday the cousin from india twenty years ago is it true and only sister miss moore pet or pastimes and penalties by rev h r Hawes, m a with fifty illustrations duodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents dogs and their doings by rev f o morris elegantly illustrated square quarto ornamental cloth one dollar seventy five cents books for young people by paul b du chailu illustrated five volumes duodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents each stories of the gorilla country wild life under the equator lost in the jungle my apingi kingdom the country of the dwarfs smiles books for young men self-help character thrift duodecimo cloth one dollar per volume published by harper and brothers new york harper and brothers will send any of the above works by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price a holiday book of the first class episcopal register philadelphia the boy travelers in the far east adventures of two youths in a journey to japan and china illustrated octavo cloth three dollars a more attractive book for boys and girls can scarcely be imagined new york times the best thing for a boy who cannot go to china and japan is to get this book and read it philadelphia ledger juvenile literature seems to have come to a climax in this book in literary quality and in material form it is a decided improvement on anything of the kind ever before produced in america new york journal of commerce one of the richest and most entertaining books for young people both in text illustrations and binding which has ever come to our table providence press published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price a nice gift for children pittsburgh telegraph the princess idleways a fairy story illustrated sexto decimo cloth seventy five cents written in a simple but charming manner and illustrated by beautiful pictures so that a youngster just past the first reading book would appreciate every word christian intelligencer new york the illustrations are worthy of special commendation any so airy pretty and full of grace have rarely appeared in any american book for children hartford courant the language in which it is told is so pure and agreeable that parents and good bachelor uncles will find it a pleasure to read it aloud to the little ones boston courier published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price what mr darwin saw in his voyage round the world in the ship beagle adapted for youthful readers illustrated octavo cloth three dollars a capital book on natural history for young readers hartford courant a superb volume filled with maps and pictures of beasts birds and fishes as well as the faces of all sorts of men and with all this a most delightful story of real travel round the world by a very famous naturalist christian intelligencer new york to the intelligent boy or girl the book will be a perfect bonanza every statement it contains may be accepted as accurately true this book shows once more that truth 
is stranger than fiction philadelphia north american it can scarcely be opened anywhere without conveying interest and instruction s s times philadelphia published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price the christian union henry ward beecher lyman abbott editors the christian union is as careful to gratify the seasonable wants of its readers as the best of the monthly periodicals syracuse journal eighteen seventy nine to eighteen eighty hints for home reading by edward everett hale m f sweetser edward eggleston fred b perkins joseph cook cookery for the million by juliet corson of the new york cooking school in the sick room by miss e r scoville of massachusetts general hospital home talks by mrs henry ward beecher a powerful serial story unto the third and fourth generation by helen campbell ten minute sermons to children by j g merrill frank beard b t vincent w w newton w f crafts jason m ludlow and others juvenile stories from the best writers including frank r stockton e huntington miller eleanor kirk hope ledyard hamilton w maybe susan coolidge mrs e c gibson louise stockton sarah j pritchard elliot mccormick lucretia p hale a new story by the author of a fool's errand zori's christmas will begin december twenty fourth plymouth pulpit a sermon or lecture room talk each week by the rev henry ward beecher sunday school papers by the rev lyman abbott and mrs w f crafts terms per annum three dollars to clergyman two dollars fifty cents four months one dollar address the christian union twenty seven paris place new york holiday goods at caldenburg's meerschaum pipes amber goods cigar holders chains etc also maker of ivory goods toilet sets combs paper folders puff boxes hair brushes chessmen etc tortoise shell combs and goods of all kinds pearl shells painted and plain in immense variety repairing in all its branches one twenty five fulton street near nassau branches astor house broadway john street corner nassau f j caldenberg toilet luxury brown's camphorated saponaceous dentifrice is the most agreeable article for cleansing the teeth ever introduced to public notice it has won its way upon its merits its mission is to beautify the face by healing the gums and whitening the teeth without result in injury it never fails to accomplish this ladies who try it once buy it right along and recommend it to others twenty five cents a bottle boys girls take notice it is now a universal saying that the undersigned are the largest dealers in scroll saws magic lanterns magical tricks skates toy engines and all new novelties as soon as manufactured send for catalogue of one hundred ninety two pages seven hundred illustrations price ten cents peck and snyder one twenty four and one twenty six nassau street new york fragrant sozo don't is a composition of the purest and choicest ingredients of the vegetable kingdom it cleanses beautifies and preserves the teeth hardens and invigorates the gums and cools and refreshes the mouth every ingredient of this balsamic dentifrice has a beneficial effect on the teeth and gums impure breath caused by neglected teeth catarrh tobacco or spirits is not only neutralized but rendered fragrant by the daily use of sozodont it is as harmless as water and has been endorsed by the most scientific men of the day sold by druggists gas the modern fuel when burned in one of morton's admirable heaters realizes the predictions of scientists that the use of gas for heating must soon far overbalance its importance as an illuminator these heaters are beautiful effective and economical interesting illustrated circular sent to any person favoring us with his address ask your gaslight company about these heaters morton gas stove company 
twenty two frankfort street new york this cut shows the style of stove in use by the metropolitan elevated railway for heating the waiting rooms of the stations wiggles these are filled in wiggles that several of our young correspondents have drawn from the outlines given in numbers three and four of young people they are the contributions of h w k jesse beale j a wells h w p j m w lil a d crane s r w fred houston and h e m wiggles similar in design were also received from cyrus o virgie cummings w g page j h grinzel sadie varin and others next week we shall show you what we make from wiggle number four and at the same time give a new one end of section nine section ten of harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirtieth eighteen seventy nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirtieth eighteen seventy nine our post office box we wish all our young readers and correspondents a very happy new year success in their studies and pleasant hours with teachers and schoolmates we hope our friendly intercourse will continue with increasing interest to them and to us at the beginning of a new year it is well to remember that the surest way to gain happiness for ourselves is by trying to make others happy Shawagunk, new york i thought i would write and tell you that i love harper's young people very much i am eight years old i have a little brother who is most two years old and i have a cat four years old i have an aquarium with six fish in it and a turtle the turtle's name is snap florence e b schuylersville new york i want to write a note to tell you how i came to take young people one evening papa brought me the first two numbers and i enjoyed the swiss boy and the other stories so much that i thought i would like to take it so my papa my mamma my two brothers and i myself gave something toward it and i shall expect it with pleasure every week kebble d galena illinois i like harper's young people very much the illustrations are beautiful and the post office box and all the other reading very interesting i read all the letters in the post office and contribute this my first newspaper correspondence to that department the picture the day before thanksgiving on the first page of number four is very comical and reminds me of things i have seen myself i am twelve years old morna p south evanston illinois i am so glad you have published this little paper i think it is the best thing i have ever seen papa reads it too and thinks it is real nice for little folks i like the story of the brave swiss boy very much f e t worcester massachusetts dear young people i like you very much especially the story of the brave swiss boy the way i came to take you was this father saw an advertisement in a paper so he let me go up to a newsroom and get you roby d c henry f b electric ornaments are not easily obtained in this country as but very few have been imported for sale montague l it would occupy too much space to describe the game you require a h a there is no such class of people as you refer to exceptional cases may exist kate s nine years your puzzles are very neat for such a little girl to compose martha w d your puzzle is good but we are afraid our young readers would never make it out as it requires an extraordinary amount of geographical knowledge inquirer madison a phonograph must be obtained of thomas a edison menlo park new jersey from whom you can also obtain a price list you will find interesting information in a book entitled the telephone the microphone and the phonograph by count du Moncel, recently published by messrs harper and brothers pleasant and welcome letters are acknowledged from abraham l m ally m b and julian s u f b h thanks for your pretty operation in figures the following explanation of the name irreverently applied to the bank of england 
is from harry h bell louisville kentucky the bank of england was founded in sixteen ninety four there is no bank equal to it in the management of national finances it is located in threadneedle street cobbett called it the old lady in threadneedle street because said he the governors of the bank were like old mrs partington an invented character of sydney smith's trying with their broom to keep back the atlantic waves of progress in national affairs end of section ten end of harper's young people volume one issue nine december thirtieth eighteen seventy nine